Hello, and welcome to Dig a Podcast, a show that tells the in-depth story behind the songs of the greatest band that is, was, and ever will be, the Beatles. In this season, season one, we will explore the Beatles' first LP, Introducing the Beatles, or our UK listeners would know it as Please Please Me. Introducing the Beatles was originally scheduled for a July 1963 release, but came out on the 10th of January 1964 on VJ Records, whereas Please Please Me was released on the 23rd of March 1963 on EMI's Parlophone label. Let's get to our penultimate song on the Introducing the Beatles album with 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 There's a place. There are an untold number of stories about popular recording artists releasing songs that they felt very strongly would be big hits, only to wind up instead as much lesser known achievements. Almost none of us could probably name the B-sides of such huge hits as I Got You Babe, Na Na Hey Hey Kiss Him Goodbye, or the Rolling Stones hit Angie. Amazingly, all of these number one hits were intended to be the throwaway flip sides while the other side of the records were thought to be the ones that would make the most impact. In the recording industry, one can never know. This was the case with the newly written There's a Place. As the Beatles excitedly entered the EMI studios on February 11th, 1963 to record their very first album, it was their priority to record this song first. They had high expectations that this serious, well-constructed song would have an impact on their career. But this was not to be. It actually ended up in a very unflattering position on the album, next to last on side 2. It was released as a single in America, but only as a flip side to the amazingly successful Twist and Shout. At a time when the US disc jockeys were playing even the flip size of singles in order to find more Beatles products to play on the air, this song was hardly noticed. In addition, after October of 1964, the song was not on any US album until 1980, which gave the song the reputation of being one of the few lost Beatles tracks. It seems that the excitement of this song waned shortly after it was recorded, although upon further listening and the passing of time, It can be assessed that the song was a truly unique, well-crafted slice of Beatles music which shouldn't be forgotten. There's a Place has truly found a place in the hearts of the Beatles fans throughout the years. Songwriting History There's a Place was my attempt at a sort of Motown black thing John Lennon remembered in 1980. But it says the usual Lennon thing. In my mind, there's no sorrow. It's all about your mind. From this quote, we could assume that John wrote the entire song himself. His reference to Motown inferring the melody and his lyrical quote inferring the words as well. Most authors have felt this for years, but while Lennon probably was the major catalyst for the song, McCartney apparently played a vital role as well. Paul owned a copy of the soundtrack album to Lennon Bernstein's 1957 musical West Side Story, which contained the song Somewhere. The lyrics began with, There's a place for us which became the original inspiration for the song. Not only is there's a place described by author Barry Miles in his book Many Years From Now as co-written, he even suggests 
that there's a bias towards being Paul's original idea since he was the owner of the soundtrack album West Side Story. While this may be a stretch, Paul's quote from said book does appear to confirm his involvement in the song's writing. But in our case, the place was in the mind, rather than round the back of the stairs for a kiss and cuddle. This was the difference with what we were writing. We were being more cerebral. At any rate, the song was included among the many that were written in the front room of McCartney's Fawthlin Road home. Since the song was so fresh in their minds, and they were so eager to spring this song out on their first album, it was estimated it was written in early February 1963, just before their recording session on the 11th of that month. Recording History Upon entering Studio 2 of EMI Studios on February 11th, 1963, to record their first album, the Beatles chose to record this newly written song first. Although nearly half of the songs on this first British album were cover songs, emphasis were given to the original material through the encouragement of their manager, Brian Epstein. With the exception of A Taste of Honey, all of the cover songs recorded for the album were done at the very end in order to fill the allotted 14 tracks on the album before the day was over. Starting at 10 that morning, the first take was complete and with all the exact nonces already in place, except for the harmonica riff which appears to have been an afterthought. George Harrison played what we know as the harmonica riff as the lead guitar part. This take was flawless except for two things. George flubbed his introductory guitar riff and Paul's vocals were recorded louder than John's. Being that all the vocals were recorded onto the same track, this deemed the take unusable. Concerning the vocal parts, Paul relates, We both sang it. I took the high harmony, John took the low harmony or melody. This was a nice thing, because we didn't have to actually decide where the melody was till later when they boringly had to write it down for sheet music. Take 2 corrected these two elements and was complete run through of the song. Upon listening, the only explanation as to why it wasn't the finished version was the producer George Martin thought it could be improved upon somehow. Take 3 was stopped immediately after the introductory guitar riff, no doubt because George Harrison's timing was a little bit late. Take 4 was complete, but even though it's early in the session, you can hear John's voice sounding a bit strained already, as he had a sore throat that day. They also experimented with some staccato rhythm guitar playing, in the final verse, which may also have influenced George Martin to have them take another stab at the song. Before take five began, the session tape caught George Harrison practicing his introductory guitar riff, which was played in octaves just like he had done for Please Please Me. In fact, he actually plays the Please Please Me riff here to get himself acclimated to playing his style. We also hear John instructing Paul on how to keep good timing during the capella line there. John explains to Paul, you gotta fix the beat. However, Paul himself stops the take after a few seconds because George was late on his guitar riff again. Take 6 was also complete with near flawlessness. Take 7 started off well but George Martin called him to a halt after George must late again with his riff at the end of the first verse. Take 8 was also complete, but with Ringo's firecracker-like drum fill before the bridge and George's stacchetto rhythm guitar work in the final verse, this wasn't good enough either. 
take line was also complete, but this time you could hear Paul's higher harmonies getting a little shaky. This and a very noticeable guitar flub in the final verse had them try it all one more time. Take 10, as it turned out, was nearly perfect, and with it being 11.30 already, and a lot on the agenda that day, they deemed this as the best. However, at 4.15pm in the afternoon, a decision was made to return to the song to improve upon it. It was decided that John should overdub three harmonica riffs for the song. These were played using the exact notes that George Harrison originally played for his lead guitar riffs in the song. Therefore, one can barely hear his lead guitar parts in the finished song. The first attempt at this overdub, Take 11, saw John's harmonica work a little shaky, and Take 12 didn't get past the first few seconds because they accidentally didn't have the harmonica volume up loud enough. However, Take 13 was the keeper, and therefore comprised the final completed version of the song. The harmonica riffs that John added were heard during the introduction of the song, at the end of the first verse, and then throughout the last 10 seconds of the song. By 4.30pm, the song was complete. The mono and stereo mixes of There's a Place were done by George Martin, assisted by Norman Smith and A.B. Lincoln, on February 25th, 1963. This mixing session was used to create both the mono and stereo masters for the first album, as well as editing the song I Saw Her Standing There and Please Please Me. The fade out at the end of the song was also accomplished at this mixing session. Thanks for listening to Dig a Podcast. You can subscribe to our podcast on Spreaker, Apple Podcasts, Spotify or any other podcasting platform. This has been a Team Wilco production. Until next time, if you know what I mean. Do I did? No? Okay.